Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Callie Waterhouse from the Arizona Association of Realtors, and we're super thrilled to welcome you to our inaugural 2017 webinar. And today we are kicking off the year with Russell Shaw, and we're going to be talking about goals and how to build your business using them and how to achieve them. Sometimes when you have a plan, you know, you have an idea and you don't have a plan, it doesn't do much good. So today, Russell is going to walk us through how to achieve your goals. And if you're not familiar with Mr. Russell Shaw, he is a native of Phoenix. He began his real estate career back in 1978. He is both a GRI and a CRS and the past president of the Arizona Certified Residential Specialists. Russell is a lifetime member of the President's Roundtable, and one of the highest honors was being ranked nationally um, number 28 and number 30 of all participating agents in the United States for most homes sold by NAR's magazine. And if you don't know Russell, you might be new to the business, but I got to tell you, he is probably the most recognizable voice um, on our audio, probably video too, I would think. <laughs> I've seen your videos, they're very impressive. So with all of that being said, Welcome, Russell. It's nice to be here. Thank you, Kelly. We are so glad that you are here. Tell us one thing about yourself that none of us would know. Uh, well, I had a. I was born in Phoenix. Let me think. I've lived here all my life. I went to Central High. Uh, I never finished high school. I went to a number of high schools. They kept kicking me out, uh, and uh, so I never bothered finishing high school. That's probably something most people wouldn't know. No. Um, I've been in sales, I've been in commission sales, uh, supported myself as a commission salesperson since I was 17. Wow. So I have uh, many years of sales. Uh, the thing that has made probably the biggest difference for me in my real estate career uh, would be having learned the subject of marketing uh, more than any other thing. And uh, there, there's so many subjects that have such terrific amounts of misinformation. Uh, marketing would be one of them. Sales would be one of them. Uh, success would be one of them. For example, with goals, I have listened to people gibber on about what's your big why? Why do, what, what's your big why for that goal? You need to have a big why. Really, who dreamt up that crap? Uh, why do you have to have a big why? Somebody says, I want a million dollars. Well, why do you want it? How about because you want it? How about because you want it? If your kid was walking into the street and you were going to yank the kid back out of the... Why do you want to yank the kid? To keep him alive. What do you think, moron? I mean, seriously. So could you just want something? Yeah. And what if you don't totally want it? Well, there's your problem. But it's not because you haven't named a big why. It's because you've got counter intention to your own goal. So we're going to take all that up. I mean, this is, I mean, this is what's actually important here. Like, let's define a goal. What is a goal? Well, you could have a couple different categories of goals. In fact, if you've got that little slide thing, if you just put, let's talk first. I'm gonna, we're going to go through some of this and, and, and beat it up a little bit. So you have three categories of existence, be, do, and have. So all goals would come into the, into, into the classification of a beingness goal, a doingness goal, or a havingness goal. The reason those would be the only categories of goals is because those are the only categories of existence itself. So, but let's take a look at this. Could you have a future goal, a present time goal, or a past goal? See, this is where people will get screwed up. So the future is be, do, have. The past would be been, done, had, and the future would be will be, will do, will have. And there's more to that. I'm going to break it down a little bit. But let's start with the past. I wish Uncle Phil hadn't died. I wish Grandpa was still alive. Well, you can wish that all you want, but if you have attention stuck on a life continuum for someone who's long since passed away, that's probably not going to be a goal that's going to, you're going to be able to achieve, number one. So we're going to talk about the right kinds of goals and the wrong kinds of goals, because if you fixate on something, I wished Anne and I had never gotten divorced. Okay. But if you did, you did. See, And if you fixate on that kind of stuff, 
it stops you. You only have so much room that you can have for what, you, what you're going to work on. And you can fill it up with nonsense. And you, that would be an example. So any goal that is a goal for something in the past, let's just start with stop. Stop screwing with that kind of stuff. Just stop it because you can't pull it off. It's just not mechanically possible. You're not going to turn time back. You're not going to go back in time. So what we want to concentrate on when we talk about goals will be future goals. The will be, will do, will have. Now what I'm going to cover next is so critical that if you miss this, you've missed the show. So let's take be, do, have, and I want you to think of, in fact, if you advance it, just one. There we go. You have a plus B, minus B, plus do, minus do, plus have, minus have. Now, the reason this is so critical to grasp, when I talk about positive thinking or negative thinking, I am not talking about whatsoever having a cheerful, positive outlook. I'm talking about the nature of thought itself. Any goal that has a negative connotation to it, I'm not talking about its evil. I'm not talking about the goodness or badness or the how moral or immoral the goal is. That has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. Or would other people agree with you wanting this? I don't give a crap. That's not relevant. What is relevant is if you want to achieve what you plan to achieve, you would have to eliminate any negative concept. For example, don't think of an elephant. You get the sign idea now. As soon as I tell you not, you just, it pops one into your head. I don't want to be like daddy. I would never want to do that. I don't want to have an accident. I just gave negative examples of each one of the three, and I want to tell you they work no matter, you, you, I don't care how you, if you put that negative connotation there, you may as well be saying, I want to be exactly like daddy. Whatever you're saying, I don't want to do, it's like you're going, please, dear God, let me do it all the time. And if I, you go, I don't want to have an accident, you may as well be saying, I hope to have lots of them and I want some right away. Mentally, it'll work exactly like that. You've heard about the law of attraction and all the, well, okay but you're going to attract what you put your attention on. If you resist something, you may as well be praying for it to happen. If you res whatever you resist, you get because you're fixating on it. You understand? I don't want to be broke. Guess what you're creating? Being broke. So I'm spending a little time on this part because it's the basis for all successful thought. Like what it, it is possible to think of what you want, decide to get it, and to get it. If, if that weren't true, I wouldn't be sitting here talking about it because it wouldn't matter. So is it possible to make a goal and achieve it? Yes. But because of the way your mind works, you'd have to follow these rules I'm covering. And if you go, I don't like those rules, well, then decide you're going to screw it up your thing and not get what you want, because that's what you'll be doing. So the goal, when we talk about a be, do, or have, the statement, your affirmation, your postulate, your decision, would have to be, in each and every case, a positive statement. But when I say positive, I'm not trying to be funny here. If you go, uh, I, I want to destroy X, okay. You could go, well, isn't that an evil thing? I'm not taking that up right now. That's not relevant to you having a philosophic understanding of this. It's only a clean statement of a be, do, or have, and not I don't want to be, I don't want to do, and I don't want to have. That's what you cannot have as your affirmation if you're going to be successful in achieving what you decide. Does, does, does that make sense so far? Because that's the part. If you get that first part, the next, the stuff we're going to follow with is actually pretty simple. If you fail to get this, so when you have an affirmation, you can call it a positive thinking. I'm going to think of my thing I want. I'll give you an example. The thing, the, the, the man who probably did more for what we would call today positive thinking uh, than any other single person would be a man, he was a medical doctor named Maxwell Maltz. He was actually a, a plastic surgeon. He wrote a book called Psycho-Cybernetics. 
Unfortunately, different morons have had taken his original texts and redone them to the point that you may as well throw his books in the trash because they, they, they just, they've been ruined by people making edits to try to explain what he was saying when in fact there was no difficulty that he had in explaining what he was saying. But what he did, he was a plastic surgeon, and some people would come in and they would go, I have an ugly nose, can you fix it for me, doctor? And, and, and he would then give a, surgically fix their nose. He was, again, a plastic surgeon. And he would fix their nose. And some people, after he fixed their nose and as a plastic surgeon, would be quite happy and quite delighted and say, thank you, doctor, this makes, this is everything. And he, but he found some people came back to see him and said, I'm still ugly, my nose is too big. And he could show them a picture of what their nose looked like, he could show them a picture of what their nose looks like now and go, look here, your nose looks just fine. And they still, from their point of view, had a big, ugly nose. Just, just don't understand, and this wasn't just limited to noses, but he, he, they, they still had this self-image that was negative. So what he did is he had them visualize 10 minutes in the morning and 10 minutes at night, twice a day, 20 minutes total, for a period of three weeks. They were to sit quietly with their eyes closed and visualize themselves looking really good and get the feeling of what it's like, like to imagine themselves looking really, really good and get the feeling of looking really good and then come back and see them. And he found that if they did that little exercise correctly, that in three weeks, they now look really good to themselves. Now, here's what's fantastic. What I'm going to tell you next uh, ruined his practice. He had people come see him with the usual, my nose is too big stuff. And instead of doing the plastic surgery, he told them to do this exercise. And he found one for one that if they would do it, they didn't need the surgery because they now believed themselves to be good looking. Now, one thing that is known is that people will act in accordance with their beliefs. Again, people will act in accordance with their beliefs. You may have a belief, in fact, I know you do. If you're listening to me now and you can hear my voice, you have beliefs that you feel, well, yeah, I believe, that's because that's the way it is. Well, it's the way you've decided it is. And if it weren't possible to change your mind, you may as well switch this off right now because the whole point of what I'm talking about is how you change what you believe. See, if you're sitting there going, well, I, I can't sell more than 10 houses a year. Oh, the hell you can't. But you first have to decide you can sell 50 houses a year or you're going to sell 100 houses a year or 200 houses a year. See, it's the decision that, you're gonna, that you, you can do that, that enables you to do it. You'll think, well, what is, uh, like in the farm, do you pass out yellow doilies or the little orange? Oh, God, don't even. It's what do you believe is true about yourself and your abilities? That's what has to change. So we go back to be, do, have. Like, what do you want to have? What do you need to do to get it? What would you need to be to do that? What do you need to believe to be successful? You understand? But the statement must always be a positive statement, a clean statement. So even a goal like, well, I want to lose 30 pounds. Now, first thing to learn is any statement that you're making as an affirmation or a postulate must be made as though it's already true. This is another one of those really critical points. If you have the statement in your head, I'm going to be a millionaire. Let's just take that one. Doesn't matter what the number is. I'm going to have 100,000 in the bank. Whatever number's real to you right now that you could go, that would be so awesome. There was a time 10 grand seemed like a lot to me. But seriously, if you go, but I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do blah, blah. You could spend, this is another one of those really critical points. You could spend the rest of your life visualizing that you're going to do it and never achieve it and having your decision work perfectly. I want to say that again, because when you add future into it, you're saying to yourself, I'm not that person yet. I'm not 
I don't have that. I don't. You, that, you may as well be telling yourself, I don't have it. So you have to change the, 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 the statement must be, I sell 50 houses a year or whatever number you have. I, that's what I'm currently doing. I'm currently closing 50 escrows a year, or whatever number you have in mind. If you're currently doing 10, make your number 25, 30. I had a guy in a class about three weeks ago. He's never broken 100,000. And I'm telling him, for you, and he goes, why can't I just decide to make a million? I said, you can decide anything you want. Well, I want to think big. Well, how about this? How about in order to achieve a goal, you have to have the idea you can. And you've told yourself so many times you can't do that. So how about you just make the number 200? And then once you've done that, make it four. Once you've done that, make it eight. You can just keep doubling it. I'm not trying to limit you. I'm trying to get you to stop giving yourself crap in a, in a sort of a subtle way by going, well, I make big goals. Yeah, so big I don't believe them. So you, want, you have to be able to believe the, the statement. But you make a statement. Let's say you had a goal like, I want to lose 30 pounds. If you have it, I'm going to lose 30 pounds, you're telling yourself, I'm not doing it now. You get that? Now, let's take that statement. You make it into, I've lost 30 pounds in 2017. You better modify that a little bit on how you did it, because if you get your leg amputated, your decision worked perfectly. I want that to sink in because I'm not making some kind of a joke. I'm giving you a really hot visual going, look at that. You could make a decision like I have no debts, okay? But how do you have no debts? Because you filed bankruptcy? Because you're dead? <laughs> you understand? Like make it where you have enough stuff to it to where you'd go, oh, God, if it works, this is how I want it. Good. Paint that picture. So you have the will be, will do, will have, and you make all the statements of a positive nature. Does anyone have a question on that before I move to the next part? Anything? So if you have a question for Russell at this time, use the question box in front of you and just type it in, and I would be happy to read it to him. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay. So what it takes to achieve a goal. Name, want, get. Now, those three things always would be part of achieving any goal. This, and these are the only requirements, by the way. I'm going to flesh them out for you, but there isn't something to add to this. I will point out that correct technology smooths out the process, but actually isn't vital. Like, well, I have to have... Charlie Swanson's super duce, duper listing presentation that Charlie charges $250 for. No, you don't. In fact, just about everyone selling some listing presentation is selling crap. Let me just start with that. If they're selling it and you can buy it, don't buy it. Give your money to the Girl Scouts. Give it to the Red Cross. Anything for sale like that, let me just classify it in one big sweeping statement as complete crap. It's unnecessary, and the people selling it are almost never successful agents, or they were temporarily, and now I've gone into screw their fellow agents business. The, the interesting thing is that almost all the people running around the country explaining how to get a zillion listings were themselves burnouts. Just, but I, because you really believe that someone like Mike Ferry was so just going, I can't stand the money from this anymore. I, I need to share my wisdom. Seriously, it was a burnout. He couldn't take it. Now, that doesn't make everything he says wrong, but I'm just making a point here. When you have someone who cannot do the thing they're teaching, even if they had nothing but correct information, which would be doubtful, they will still misevaluate the data. Anyone making a statement in an advertisement or from a stage, learn to list 98% of the appointments you go on. Well, either they're a knowing liar or a moron who can't count. No one in the history of real estate has ever achieved that kind of number, not with individual sellers, like somebody said, well, I had one appointment in 2008 with a Fannie Mae person. I got 900 listings that year from Fannie 
and my one appointment was fantastically successful. Awesome. Replicate that today. So when we're talking about this kind of stuff, you always get somebody, well, I get this. There's an agent now, and he's a successful, bright guy. He's the number one agent in an arm list for buyer deals. But he has a single source for those buyer deals. What's that mean? It's no different than the flip side when the listing agent had their, they had a Fannie Mae account. It can go away. 25 years ago, the number one agent in all of Phoenix, maybe actually 30 years ago, come to think of it, was David Johnson. David took more listings and sold more houses than anybody else in the Valley, period. He did contingency removals for Emerald Homes, and he did a damn good job. He was truly amazing. Now, what happened? Emerald got a new sales manager, and that guy just decided they didn't need David. And David's business went just like of somebody who had a Fannie Mae account. There's agents that were doing like five, six million a year. They got a Fannie account. They're doing 90 million. That market goes away. They're back to four million. Why? Well, what, what is the most important skill? What is the most important skill for a residential realtor? More than all other things combined. Your broker is going to tell you learning the contract. No, hell, there's people who couldn't even read the contract and they're successful. There's people that could not, they don't even know what the bins are, they, they don't know any of that stuff, and they're still successful. Well, how's that? Well, what's the most important skill a residential realtor can have? More than all, in fact, it's so important that if you're good at this one thing, you could, I'm not recommending it, you could be crappy at everything else, and it won't matter, you can still be successful. And if you're lousy at this, it won't matter how good you are at all the other stuff, you're going to fail. That one thing is lead generation, not lead conversion. Lead conversion is a companion skill. Most agents that have been in the business four or five years are astoundingly good at lead conversion. They have to be. They're so god-awful at lead generation. It is lead generation alone that gives you the freedom to say to any seller, to any buyer, that you get a bad vibe off of, you should work with someone else. And that is exactly what you should be doing. And you could start today. If there's somebody that you wish when your phone rings and you sort of cringe because your phone's lighting up and you hope it's not them, stop doing that to yourself now. End of conversation. Seriously. Unless you just go, well, I've done some awful shit and I need to make up for it somehow by taking this crap. No, stop it. Just stop it. You say, I don't have any other customers. I guarantee you with your mind freed up, you can go get some. They aren't that scarce. So start with that. So let's go back to what does it take to achieve a goal? You have to be able to name it. If you cannot name it exactly, you can't want it. And a goal, by definition must be something you would know if you did it. Well, you get people want to be successful. What's that mean? Well, you know, successful. No, I don't know. What does that mean? You tell me what that means. How would you know if you were successful? If you had a Cadillac? If you drove a Mercedes Benz, are you then successful? If you drive a Benz, but your payment's 2000 a month, at what point are you successful? See, that's a nonsense statement. I want to be rich. Well, I guarantee you, whatever you think rich is, whatever that it would even mean, when you get that much money, it won't seem rich. You go, what if I had a million? No, it won't. No, get to a million in cash, and you'd go, crap, this isn't very much. Because whatever amount you have doesn't impress you. Never. You've got it. That's nothing. I did it. Now, I'm not saying there isn't a number that would impress you, but you understand what I'm getting at here. So the point is, you have to name it. What do you want? Well, I want to be popular. Does that mean 100 people like you? 4,000 people like you? 200 would recognize you on site? What, what, it, you, it must be specific. See, if you said, I want more customers, how many more? 10 more a week? One more a day? What's the number? Make it a goal you could name, and you would know at the end of the day, I did not add, or I did add, five new people into my previously met database. It must, the goal must be specific. I want 
six escrows to close in February. That's not five, it's six. I want six escrows to close by the end of by February 28th. Well, that's a goal, see? It's a statement, it's, it's a thing. So all the goals must have a name that you would know. You, I, I want a red Corvette. You could check it off, I got it. Well, I got a black one. That's not a red one. The goal was a red one. Do not modify your goal. If it's your goal, go for it. You start modifying your goal and toning it down to suit someone else or to go into agreement with someone around you, well, now you've just opened the door to, maybe that's not really what I want. Well, if it is what you want, go ahead and want it. Go right ahead and want it. I'll authorize it right now. If you need something in writing, uh, Kelly can fix a little form. It'll come from AAR, and she can have Michelle Lynn sign off on it. Russell Shaw authorizes you to name whatever the hell you want and go for it. You have full authorization. So the first thing is name it. If you can't name it, you can't. You, there's nothing more to do after. You must be able to name what it is you want. And name means an exact name of a thing that's a that you can go. Well, it can be done. It's not like, well, I want to levitate my body in the air. Well, how about we pick something? You go. We know it's done. We know it's possible. We know it's a possible thing to do. And I'm going to do it. That's it. So it's a name. A named goal. It's in the will be, will do, will have category. And you can name it exactly, and you can make a statement that I'm, I'm getting, it's, I'm, it's done, I got it. Now, the want. Most people are dispersed on the subject of their goals with a dispersed want. They're confused. They want, well, I want it, and I don't want it. I want the six closings in February. I don't know if everyone will still like me if I'm that successful. I don't know, it's going to feel weird. I've never had that much money before. That's going to be a lot of work. That's going to be a lot of work. See, if, if, if you only did 10 sales and you jumped it to 20, all you have to do is decide I'm doing 20. I do 20 deals now. Do you need a system? Nope. Just decide you're doing 20. It's that simple. How about, nope, nope, don't complicate it. You can just decide. If you're going from 10 to 20, you got nothing more than you make the decision because you're already wasting so much time anyway, screwing off, doing things that don't make any difference whatsoever. But if you were doing 10 deals a year and you went to 20, just do twice as much of whatever the effective action was that got you the 10, you'll still have three or four days a week to waste completely. Uh, so it's don't, don't worry about you're going to be overworked at 20 deals. When you get up to about 40, 50 deals, more deals... 60 deals don't equal just money, they equal pain, unless you have some systems in place. But let's go back, you name what you want, you name it, and then do you want it unconditionally? I mean really want it, not sort of want it. You want it. Well, you know, so if I said, do you want a cup of coffee? Yes, you want a cup of coffee? No. You want a cup of coffee? God, it smells good but the caffeine would make me kind of jittery. So, oh boy, I do like coffee. I don't want it this late in the day. Well, I, God, that smells good. But it makes me, see, you have, I want it and I don't want it. Now, you want to buy a house? Yes. You want to sell a house? Yes. You want to, you want to, you want to sell your house now? No. You want to buy a house today? No. Those are easy. Those are really easy. If the guy's not going to buy a house, how much time could you possibly waste not selling him one? You understand? You want to sell your house? No. How much time could you, even if you worked at being a dope, how much time could you spend wasting with that guy who's not going to sell to not sell his house? Now, here's where the problem comes in. The word maybe. Do you want to sell your house? Maybe. Do you want to buy a house? Maybe. I mean, if the deal was right, I would buy one. Do you want to sell your house? Well, if I could get the right price, yeah, I would sell it. So he wants to sell and he doesn't want to sell. Now, that's nice. So he's on a maybe on does he want to buy a house or sell a house? You want some coffee? Well, maybe. See? Now, you hang around enough people on maybe 
you'll be on a maybe on the question, are you a realtor? And there's the difficulty most agents are having. The new ones, or the ones that haven't made a sale in a while, actually have thoughts just like this. Well, if I could make a sale by March, I'm staying in the business. If I could make a deal by the, well, even by the end of March, I would stay. You're already half gone. You've already decided you're leaving. You understand what I'm saying to you? See, if you have this kind of, well, if this and if that. So the first thing you'd have to decide on being a realtor, this is what you do. This is it. You don't have this, well, you know, if this doesn't work out, I'm going to. Just get, get the hell out now. Save yourself the misery. Just save yourself the miserable time you're going to have for the next two years. Better Homes and Gardens used to have on a website. They took it down because I like to point to it on blog posts all the time. But they used to have on a website. This is something they did had about 10, 12 years ago. And it said that they had discovered a really interesting trend that said that 13 out of 14 agents were gone from the business after 18 months. Now, I don't know how you define the word trend, but that statement would have been true when I got in the business in 1978. It was true for agents in 1960, still true today. Most agents fail out of the business rapidly. Some are inefficient at leaving and take longer to leave. Most full-time agents don't even do that much business. Like they just sort of barely make it. And it's so silly because that doesn't have to be that way. So people come in the business and they do really well. And they have one thing in common if they're doing really well. They're good at lead generation. And there's only two ways to generate leads. I know that people that sell crap to agents complicate it, but there's just these two methods. You prospect or you market. That's the end of the list. Prospecting is where you do something to reach out to them. Marketing is where you they do you do something to get them to reach to you. So, for example, internet stuff would be marketing. Geographic farming could possibly be a combination of marketing and prospecting. Cold calling, door knocking would obviously be strictly prospecting. So you'd need to get good at one or both of those. How do you get good at being a lister? See, how would you get good at being a listing agent? Because that's really, if you're going to become independent from real estate, you're either going to buy real estate or you're going to get good at taking listings. That's the end of the list. Well, how would you get good at being a lister? I can tell you exactly how to get good at being a lister. I have no question about it. Anyone who wants to go is another way, I go, really tell me that. Tell me what that other way is, because I've never seen it. There's only one way to get good at being a lister. That is to go on lots and lots and lots and lots of listing appointments. And you go, but I'm not good at those. I know you aren't. In fact, if you've been on less than 50 of them, I can tell you right now you're crappy as hell. And you go, well, I took 10 listings last year. You're still crappy. What you know how to do is fill out the form. What you know how to do is fill out the form. That does not make you a good lister. So the first thing you'd have to know to learn something, anything, is you'd have to know there's something there to learn, and you'd have to believe there was something worthwhile that you could learn it. And learning to list, which is very, very, very different than working buyers. Working buyers is relationship-based selling. If you're Pleasant, easy to get along with, have a lockbox key, don't smell bad, and have a car, you're fine. You've been in the business two weeks, they don't care. Buyers are not looking for an agent, they're looking for a house. They're willing to tolerate the agent in order to get into the house. You go, that's not flattering. It's still true. If you want to buy a car, you do not go, good God, I hope I meet a really great car salesman today who's just fun to be around. Uh, that would be so awesome. You don't care. You, you, in fact, you're willing to tolerate the salesman to get access to the car and the information about the car. That's it. Now, listings, on the other hand, so who interviews agents? Sellers interview agents because sellers are paying the agents. And people go, well, they're paying them with the buyer's money. Really? I think you're an idiot if you even think that. If I consulted you, I'm glad. 
in an appraisal, you do not see the commission marked out as a, as a fee. So if the seller could sell his house for the same price I can sell it for, the seller made the difference. But hardly any seller can ever sell a house for how much I can sell that house for. I'll come back to that later. Let's go back to like realistic things. So what do you have to do to become a good lister? Go on a lot of listing appointments. I made a statement earlier that when someone says they list 98%, they're nonsense liars that can't count. Let me give you some real numbers, and I'm back to my real, like this is where things are. Last year, my numbers were, of interviews to listings taken, 57.51%. If I took the 15 years prior to the run-up in prices, so take 2004 and go back to 1999. I'm sorry, go back 15 years, 15 consecutive years. My numbers at the table of listing appointments to listings taken ran on any given month between 56 and 58%. Those are real numbers. I've personally been on at the table over 2,000 times. I don't go on appointments now, but my top lister, JC, he has been to the table more than 6,000 times. I just want to put this in perspective. So these aren't sort of a, well, this was a little fluke in a week. We took 10 listings in a row or we had, uh, you know, I went 17 appointments. I did one time, 17 appointments in a row without a listing. But the averages, the how do we count a listing appointment? It's a very novel method. They thought we were coming. We had a time. We showed up. They let me in. It counts. Did we list that? Did we walk out with a signed listing or not? And when you hear someone say, well, do you believe in two-step appointments or one? It's not up to you. It's up to the seller. If you're familiar with the DISC system, if the seller is a high C, you aren't listing it on the first appointment, period. If the seller is a high D, he probably doesn't want to see you again. Where does he sign? But do not confuse this as though it's something you decide. So what your beliefs are about it is not relevant either. It's who are you talking to? So... The reason I'm telling you these numbers, that we're at around 57%, is that if, if, you're, if you're only talking to people you know really well, like I listed your brother's house, your mom's house, and your best friend's house, yeah, you could go on three appointments and go, I got all three of them. But start going to strangers, and you're going to notice a little different ratios. And you're going to find out it's not quite the same. So if you're a new agent, you might be doing good to take an up if you've got a listing for on every four appointments. And, and I'm telling you that so you don't give yourself crap for taking, like you went on eight appointments and got two listings. I'm going, well done. Awesome. If I'm coaching someone, there's only one stat I care about. Just this one stat. How many appointments did you go on? Not how many listings did you take, how many appointments did you go on? Because if you're going on enough appointments, the rest of it will take care of itself. Now, if you say, let's say you live in Peoria, and you go, I don't really want to call on my neighbors. Pop out to Apache Junction or East Mesa and practice on them. Go to those tables, because you won't care if you get the listing or not, which is exactly the correct attitude. It's exactly the correct attitude for real, and go to the table. The only possible problems anyone could ever have in getting listings is either at the table or getting to the table. In 2005, your big problem would have been getting to the table because the we do nothing for less folks preempted an awful lot of tables by just getting the listing and selling it. So your big problem is getting to the table. If you've been to the table less than 50 times, I could make the sweeping statement, you have a crappy presentation, because the way you get a good presentation is going to the table and practicing. I can tell you there's about 18, 19 different objections or ideas someone could have by not listing with you. I've had people say, well, I have the list. Throw it in the trash. It won't matter. You find out the questions and the objections one at a time by feeling stupid at the table. Any other method really won't work well. You have to be willing to feel stupid. 
And when you achieve that feeling stupid, you then get smart so that you can go back and get stupid again. And you keep doing that. I'm not making a joke here. You keep getting smart, getting stupid, getting smart, getting stupid, until you wind up like, I'm pretty damn smart on this subject now. By the time you've been on 50 appointments, you will have had the book thrown at you one piece at a time, and you'll actually know how to handle seller objections. So that's how you get that. So again, we go with name, exact thing, want. You have to want it unconditionally. And we're going to come back to this because you have, on any goal, if you make a statement, I am an accomplished listing agent. You can just make that one. I'm an accomplished, for you, you can make that. I'm an accomplished listing agent. I'm comfortable in all situations with all people. You can have that as an affirmation. Now, you may think, well, I'm sort of lying, because all of your own counter intention on what a big goofball you are and how you don't know is going to come to the surface as soon as you start postulating that. So there is something you can do to get rid of your counter intention. But if you just look, if you can name what you want and you want it, and get rid of the counter intention of not wanting it, and just simply have a clean, I want that, you're going to get it. Whatever it is, you're going to get it. You have to believe you can. Now, one of the most interesting things, if I bring up the name Roger Bannister, a few of you might know who Roger is. Roger is a retired medical doctor living in the United Kingdom. When Roger was a young man, he was in medical school. He ran every day on his lunch hour. Roger is the first man in recorded history to run a mile in less than four minutes. Prior to Roger, it was a known scientific fact. It could not be done. A horse could do it. A man could not do it. And the fastest runners in the world knew they couldn't do it. Next thing I would tell you, Roger did it. He's in the history books. You can Google this, look at any, he is, he is the guy. You say, who was number two? There's a little marketing lesson. No one cares. So from a standpoint of marketing, it doesn't matter who's number two or number three. But here's what's the most amazing thing about this story. So Roger had to believe he could do it. That's the first thing I'll point out, or he wouldn't have kept trying. But here's what happened next. The next 90 days, two other runners did it. That following year, 19 other runners did it. Some of them did it faster than Roger. Now, here's the point I'm making. What changed? Did Super Wheaties come out that week? Or did guys who were already, they were runners. They didn't learn to run after Roger did it. They were already runners. But wouldn't they had to have decided something along the lines of, well, hell, if Roger can do it, I can do it, because it wouldn't be any more complicated than that. But Roger can do it, I can do it. And they did it. They were right once they changed their mind. So if you went to, see, here's the thing. If you're looking for counterintention, you won't have any trouble finding it. See, if you went to an agent like, oh, Brett Tanner or Joanne Calloway, or you walked up to me and said, I'm going to sell 100 houses this year. What do you think I'd tell you? What do you think Joanne would say? What do you think Brett Tanner would say? I just want you to get this. Awesome. Joanne might say it more like, that's wonderful, dear. But, but you get my point. We wouldn't be telling you, well, how the hell are you going to do that? But if you just walked up to people in your office and said, I'm going to sell 100 houses this year, do you think you'd have any problem finding someone to ask you? Well, just how in the hell do you plan to do that? And the problem is you don't know how you plan to do it yet. So the first thing I'm going to tell you is don't go around sharing that with everyone. Don't go telling everyone you meet, I'm going to do that. I've heard people say, well, tell the world your goal. No, don't, unless you're hoping to have it shredded right away. Like if you have someone who will support you in that goal, awesome. But if you don't believe they will, you don't need to announce it in advance. If you're at 10 deals and want to go to 20, you decide it. You can tell yourself, but don't go around telling people who are going to want to make nothing of your goal. Just don't do that. See, it's different. There's a point where you get to a certain point in any skill where you don't need anybody's agreement and don't give a damn if they agree or not. But when you just have this goal, it's just a little embryonic goal. 
you need to nurture it. You need to baby it a little bit. You need to support it. And you need to get rid of the counter intention. Is there any questions on anything I've said so far? Anything. Anything. There's been just a couple of people who have shared their own um, percentages. Uh -huh. Like they've gone on, uh, like Craig's been on 40 listing appointments last year and got 24 listings out of the 40. Awesome. So things like that. Uh, but two cents. Craig's been in business since 1977. Say it again. Craig's been in business uh -huh. since 1977. So I'm thinking he has experience. Yeah, yeah. He's been to the table a thousand times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and the other thing is it depends on what kind of list you're working off of. See, if you have a Rolodex that's big enough to where you're really calling on past clients most of the time, those are going to be very different percentages as opposed to your calling on primarily strangers. So I don't want to make some statement here. Somebody says, well, I'm listing 70% of the appointments. Awesome. There's no problem. I have no quarrel with that. But if you're an agent who's been in the business for 20 years, don't tell some guy six months in those those guys. He, that's not a real goal for him. I, I remember one time when I was in the life insurance business, it was 1969, and this real nice man had come down from Flagstaff, I was with New York Life, to talk to us. And he really was a nice man. But what he said to me, to the whole room full of us, we were all young idiots. Now I've just become an older idiot, but what made it kind of nice is uh, he said that he, all he did now was he had his secretary lay out on his desk Monday through Friday, he, he didn't work weekends. He, he just had five of his past clients on his desk every day with their names and phone numbers, and he would call them and just chat with those people and ask them if they needed anything or knew anyone that might need his service. And from this alone, this one action alone, he had this wonderful business. And I thought, well, this won't take me, to, I won't even have to spend the end of the week to get all my past clients. In fact, I'll be able to call them all today and tomorrow by using that method. And I looked around the room I was in and thought, there's no one in here who has made more than 25 sales, so there won't be anyone in the room. The point is, it wasn't that what he said wasn't true. It was just irrelevant. It had nothing to do with us because I didn't have a bunch of past clients. So if you're only calling on people that you know quite well, and if you have enough of them, if you think I'm sitting here advocating, no, go call on strangers. Like Mike Ferry used to tell people, just knock on new doors and don't go back to the same neighborhood that resembles farming. Okay, moron. But if you have a bunch of relationships, that's a very different thing. But sometimes I'm trying to help someone. They're new to town. They don't know a bunch of people here. Telling them, well, what you do is you call all your past they don't have a bunch of past. So it depends on the circumstances. Any other questions? Anything that we haven't got touched on? Anything? A couple of questions from brand new agents okay. about where to start. How where? do you get those first listing appointments? Well, the first thing, if you're really a brand new agent, if you're really brand new and you haven't done any business yet, haven't done a bunch of deals yet, the first thing I'm going to tell you is do not concentrate on listings to start. I know that might startle you. Uh, what I would tell you is take the listings that fall in your lap. I'm not telling you not take listings. Take the ones that fall in your lap. The thing to do if you're brand new in the business is go sell 10 or 12 houses. Like to learn how the contract works, to learn how deals go together. Uh, it'll be much, much easier to establish credibility with a buyer when you're brand new, and, and even if they're strangers, than it will be with a seller. So if you go after buyers first, they'll be easier to get, easier to put together. And once you've does, done a dozen of them, and you know how the streets are, and what, you know, if you're in Mesa versus, oh God, uh, Baseline Road changes cities three times as you go to the East Coast. All the little stuff that you're going to have to learn if you work in the Old Valley, and I recommend you do, uh, then bridge over into concentrating on listing appointments. That, did I get that question? You got it. It's very good. A um, couple of people who are just talking about um, starting over again in real estate, and it's difficult. Yes. It's So what would be like your one, give me one point, start here. Start here? Well, the thing you'd want to start with, if you're starting over or you're new, it would be the same thing. You want to get something 
like let, let's say you're starting over or you're starting new if you're from here you have people that know you that re would recognize you on site they liked you but you need to come out of non-existence as a realtor they'll still think of you as like Joe who worked down the hall at Motorola or whatever you did you were a school teacher or whatever so like there was this one guy he he worked in heavy equipment leasing and he'd worked with us I said and they were only and I had talked to him about this a couple years ago and I said okay so he wanted to know what I thought he should do I said go to those heavy equipment there's only a couple of them here in town leasing companies be at every one of their sales meetings in his case take them donuts real nice guy and I said and let them know you're a realtor every time you don't even need to ask them for business when I hear people say well you have to have a call to action no you don't unless you want to assume buyers and sellers are idiots like you I need to have in my farm email my you know, call us now right now no most people aren't even you just you need to come off as credible if they ever had a question could they call you so get something printed up something I don't care what it is a list of libraries a recipe uh, when the Suns play something that if you got one you'd go well hell I keep that I'd put that on my refrigerator whatever something that honest to God if you got one you'd go thank you so whatever it is the only person we're surveying here is you put your name put your company name whether you're Century 21 or Realty Executives or Home Smart whatever it is but and a picture of you a current picture of you if you're 50 don't use a picture when you were 30 a new picture a picture that actually looks like what you look like so when they look at it they can look at you and go well, that's the guy you're the one you're that person and you have all that stuff on this little thing on one side of the thing printed up and you can get them off Kinko whatever doesn't matter it doesn't have to be fancy and you make a list of those people where they are you don't call any of them you go see them and you drop that thing off and hopefully you catch them in and you hand them one and say I was just in the area even if you drove 10 miles to be in that area you were just in the area I wanted to pop by and leave you with one of these I'm in the real estate business now and just wanted to let you have this and get the hell out as you're walking out turn and say by the way if you know anyone that needs to buy or sell a house please keep me in mind and get out like let them see you let them see who you are and that you are in the real estate business and then if you want to start mailing them something at least once a month reminding them you're in the real estate business but if you went out and called on a hundred people just a hundred you'd actually have your business launched and I don't care if you're coming back into the business or you're brand new it would work the same way you need to come out of non-existence as an agent you're a realtor now and if they stop you and talk, want to ask a bunch of questions or talk about some house down the street or whatever, answer their questions. Okay? Anything else here? Anything? I just want to go back. Um, what you're saying applies to both listings, uh -huh. sellers, and buyers. Correct. Right? Absolutely correct. Okay. And now let's flip to the next slide. So I don't want to. So your goal must be in writing. You must be able to know you did it. Go to the next one, please. And you must get rid of your own counter intention. So I called mine my enemy line list. You can call it your toxic thought list. Uh, if you want to get a complete hat write up, there's a website which is number one homeagent.com, N U M B E R numeral one homeagent.com. That's my agent success blog. If you go to that site, which is it's hor horribly organized but fantastic content and you type in the search box the two words enemy line you will see two blog posts come up read them both carefully it is a write-up on how to do this particular action like we won't have time to cover it during this webinar but I could not overemphasize you're going to want to take your goal write it out and you're going to want to identify and name every single dumb thought you have in your head and there's an example there of a guy who sent his list in to me his name isn't given obviously but he here this was his dumb list of thoughts and you have them. that those thoughts are what are holding you back 
and you want to take every single one of those dumb thoughts and I cannot overemphasize you must do it in writing if you just like right now you go well I already know the thought no you don't the stuff you can spot right now is not the mooring line that's holding you back it's just a thought that's popped into your head you need to write it down it must be separate from you this this is the key whether you put it on a like a yellow pad and write it out or you type it into word or whatever I, I remember it was one lady from Alabama she's a sweetheart she says to me when I was teaching this class I can't remember what city I was in and on this particular subject and she said well do you just burn the list and I said no you keep it why well I said where do you think these dumb thoughts came from when you were tired or hungry I said you think you're never gonna get tired or hungry again they'll come back this way you can spot there's a thought that's in direct conflict with my goals. And she said, well, what if there's something that's really real? Make sure you get it on the list. Make sure you get it on the list. You go, well, that's a real idea. There's an idea, she just told me, there's an idea that I've gone into such thorough agreement with, I'll use it to fail. So what I just covered is one of the most vital pieces of all. Every one of your dumb thoughts must be in writing and separate from you so you can look at them and you're not carting it around in your head. And you'll know when you've gotten one of the hot ones because you won't know whether to laugh or to cry. And this isn't a list for you to start sharing with everyone because you'll find most of this stuff's crazy. That's right, it is but I want you to spot those crazy thoughts and have them separate from you. And you don't have to be in agreement with them. And if you have that, if you'll do that, you go, well, how long will it take to do that? I don't know, a couple hours at the first time you sit down. Then you're going to drive along, oh God, I just thought of some more. Exactly. Well, you send the list and every time you think of more, write them down and put them on that list of here's thoughts I've used to sabotage myself. We don't care where they came from. This isn't a matter of did daddy tell me this? It was this Uncle Ernie. It doesn't matter. How did I get it? Like, you know, when a kid, if you ever had kids, 90%, no, probably 95% of the time, something's wrong. Feed them, put them to bed. Feed them, put them to bed. They're tired or they're hungry. Agents get tired and hungry. They're sort of like, hey, it's three in the afternoon. All I've had all day is coffee. Awesome. <laughs> Not. But you understand what I'm saying? Sort of a pride of I didn't even time to eat breakfast or lunch. That's how dedicated I am. Well, dedicated to going around without body, with horrible body rudiments and just sort of begging to get upset. But anyway, that's that step. Let me see if there's something else here we need to do. Last question, anything. All right, so let's talk about if you had to choose marketing or prospecting. You can only choose one. You have to go with prospecting. Uh, here's why. If you had the money to market when you started, you'll waste it all anyway. Uh, Gary Keller built Keller Williams from nothing to the largest agent company in the world and he never once bothered with marketing. Now, can you get to 100 deals a year from prospecting only? Yes, you can. I know numerous agents who do just that. Are you going to get to 500 without marketing? Nope. No, you're not. But it's a different problem. So get to 100. Like seriously, get to 100 deals and then learn to market if you want to take it further. But if you had to just pick one, it's easy. If you want to say, what is the profile look like of the typical top producer across the United States? It's simple. They're a listing agent who has a geographic farm. Out of the top 1,000 agents, at least 950 of them would fall in that category. They would almost fit Callaway's profile perfectly listing agent with a geographic farm or Kenny Kloss, same kind of deal out in East Valley. So if you had to just pick a thing, that's, that's a combination of marketing. But when you're brand new, you don't have the money to finance the farm. And people that go, well, you can usually make it pay a lot of money in the first six months. Not without doing some door knocking, you're not going to. If you're just doing mailings, you're going to be a year or so before you break even. So that's the truth. I don't care what you mail. Very good. Well, that's a great answer. Um, and what are your favorite prospecting techniques? 
I think I have to say calling people. Uh, when I was younger, I would just show up. I'm not that hungry now, to be really honest. I mean, there was a time, you know, if you said, uh, well, if you got in your car and drove out to East Mesa, you could make a $2,000 commission. I'm not driving out to East Mesa for $2,000. Today, I mean, I'm not making a joke, but I, I might have a really high willingness to talk on the phone to customers, like almost everyone I have three, actually four now, uh, no, I can't even remember, three listing specialists, uh, four buyer agents. So I don't really go on the appointments, but almost every single seller now, it's been true for years, so it, before they, I talk to them, I'm, I'm the one that books the appointment. So I answer their questions and chit chat with them. And uh, that's probably the most favorite thing I do. I don't think I ever want to turn other than to let Wendy do some of those calls when we get it to the point where I can't mechanically do them all, mm -hmm. uh, which is a goal that I have where we get so busy she has to do uh, like 40% of them or something. But I actually like doing that. I really get a kick out of it, uh, talking to the sellers. One of the most startling things I think they think when they call, they, I know they've talked to some of their agent, they don't want to move until April. And they've talked to someone who told them, list it right now. I tell them, I wouldn't list it right now if I were you. They're like, really? Why not? Well, we sell the house immediately, which is what you hired me to do. Where are you going? Uh, if it takes 45 days to close, shouldn't we move it closer to that? And just from that kind of stuff alone, like I call it just being honest, they're like, huh. So I get a lot of business when I'm in competition by simply not lying to them. Because that's what they're really looking for, someone who will be straight with them. And we return all our calls. That's the other thing. The, Do you answer your phones? I don't ever answer the phone. I don't ever want to get stuck on a communication cycle that has nothing to do with me. And, and so if it's about an escrow, I don't need to hear it. You go, well, somebody's upset about a Binzer. I won't care. It's not my, I mean, literally, I don't, like, the people that I have working for me and with me are better at those jobs they have than I ever was. And they answer their phones. When their oh, phones God, yes. ring. They, oh, God, yes. I think oh. that's one of the complaints that we hear, you know, quite a bit is, is realtors don't answer their phones. It's the number one complaint that the public has with realtors. It's the number one complaint that realtors have with other realtors. Mm -hmm. It's not, well, so-and-so was dishonest or so-and-so cheated me or they lied about this or that. Oh, no, no, no. The number one complaint that the public has about realtors and the number one complaint by far that realtors have about realtors is they can't get a return phone call. Uh, I will never forget calling an agent. This is back when I used to use AZ Central and she was paying for a premium slot. She was paying for a premium slot for her listing and the link was broken. And it was just this one, like she was, she was paying more than I was paying. I knew it because I didn't, I turned down that deal. It was too much money. I thought for that deal. I called her three different times to try to tell her about it. She never called me back. And this, I mean, just seemed to me like this complete neglect. And what I was trying to do, I finally just left her a message. She never called to say thank you, to say, that's the kind of crap. Uh, and, and, and I'm not picking on someone. I'm just saying that's so far out of communication. I, you know, if you say if someone calls my office, they get a return call. Well, of course they're going to get a return call. Like if we're in a meeting, they can't. We're not going to interrupt. But but the point is, we have a staff meeting, and we're not interrupting the staff meeting for a phone call. We won't know the phone call occurred until we come out of the meeting. But of course, every call's returned. Every call's returned. What if it's a stupid call? I mean, I'm not talking some vendor deal, how we'd like your business. I'm talking a customer or a, an agent with a problem or a complaint. We're, they're getting a call back that day as soon as possible. My the, the rule would be, how would we like to be treated? How would I like it if it was my buyer agent calling? Well, then that's whatever that standard is, that'd be how we want to treat every other agent, period. So I hope that's an answer there. I think it's an excellent answer. And folks, just uh, for everyone who asked about Russell's website, it's on your screen at this moment. It's number, N-U-M-B-E-R, the number one, homeagent.com. Yeah, that's my agent success. My, my regular website is called nohasslelisting.com. 
But that is actually going to address, if I tell you that at this point, everything you would need to be successful is on that site, and it's free. Everything. I was telling Russell that I attended one of his seminars over a decade ago <laughs> <laughs> at Mesa Community College, and he was talking about pricing homes. So uh, uh, he has uh, grown. Yeah. Well, the pricing <laughs> is only on pricing homes. Like there's this, there's one of the one of the classes. It's all there's a video of it. It's called How to Correctly Price a Home, and that's on the site too. You can just scroll down and find it. And it's the complete seminar with all the notes that were taken at the very first class by a professional, he has, has a PhD in economics, that wrote the notes. There is the video and uh, all the handouts that I used from that original class. They're all online. And, and I will tell you, like, if you have like, the, the delusion that price per square foot is the correct way to price a home, then you would get the same nonsense answer that Zillow gets. If a home was 2,000 square feet, and some other home exactly like it was 1,500 square feet, and it's in the same neighborhood, the 2,000 square foot home is not under any condition worth 25% more. You cannot ever use a formula like that. And that is the most common idiotic error made. And so there's a class, there's on how to, the real truth, because it's not that no one knows how to price a home. Lots of agents know how to price a home. The problem is they don't know what they know. They can't teach what they know. And so when someone asks them, can you show me how you do it? You get crap answers back like, well, it's just this knack I have. And unfortunately, they, they don't know what they know, but they know something. And it cannot possibly be price per square foot because with the training you have, because you're not a contractor, you're not an appraiser, you don't know enough to ever even consider price per square foot. That's the truth. And folks, just a reminder that Russell is a broker, but he may not be your broker. And of course, we always recommend that you talking to your office manager or broker if you have specific questions. Um, Russell, we're going to wrap up at this point. Any last one big piece of advice to put a bow on today's webinar? I'm, well, I appreciate you having me here. Uh, this is the first webinar I've actually done like this, and you've been a joy, seriously. To, it's Thank been just you. effortless for me, and so I, I'd you. be happy to come back and do it again. I just, this has been fun for me. I hope it has been for everyone listening. Well, we have so many people who have said thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Russell, thank you so much for thank joining you. us. Folks, thank you very much for joining us today. Today's webinar was recorded and will be available on our website. Um, I will be sending out an email when it comes available, probably in the next week or so. Just a reminder that our next webinar is February 7th. We're going to cover the basics and getting started with Realtors Property Resource, RPR. And then, of course, we want to invite you to join us in Prescott March 28th through the 31st for our Arizona Realtor Convention. You can go online to aaronline.com slash convention for more information. Folks, thank you so much for joining us today. We wish you the very best and have a great day.